Don't try to sneak into your room like that. I know what you've got behind your back. Records. More no records. So don't look at me. Craig, it's so great to talk to you on to uh, Atlantic's 75th anniversary. So this is like the second year of the celebration? Yes. Because yeah, it was 1947 when it was founded? Yeah, and the first release, the corporation was started in 47, and then the first release was in 48. Yeah. And so you've been the uh, chairman since uh, 2005? Yeah. So it's been a pretty interesting ride, I imagine. In roller coaster. A lot of turmoil in the record business. The industry's gone through a lot. And you've weathered that storm pretty well. You're still here. Thank and you. Thank you. <laughs> so let's get to the questions. Um, so in 1967, Atlantic Records became a wholly owned subsidiary of Warner Brothers Seven Arts. I remember that. And today it's owned by the Warner Music Group. But unlike some other swallowed up labels that have lost their brand identity, Atlantic still has a really strong brand identity and the logo is means something to so many people. So what accounts for that? Well, I think in 67, when the new owners bought Atlantic, I think they sort of appreciated the identity and the leadership of Ahmed Erdogan and, and um, Jerry Wexler. And it was definitely, I think, an intention to preserve the direction and, and empower these entrepreneurs. Uh, three years later, Electra was acquired, and and that was Jack Holtzman, who was you know incredible record man as yeah. well. Still is, and um, still with us, absolutely. Yeah. And um, and so it was you know it was definitely important to keep a brand identity, and we certainly tried to keep that throughout um, you know our days as well. And it was a, it was a small group of individuals who actually were known to the average consumer. I mean, Jerry Wexler was a known quantity and Ahmed was a known quantity to even casual record buyers, I think, to a certain yeah, ab degree. Yeah, absolutely. So it's partly that. Yeah. And they the were, catalog was so eclectic. Yeah, absolutely. And so in your reign of, of running the company, what do you do to try to keep that going? I mean, you're a known quantity too now, so. Well, I think, I think both myself and my partner, Julie, we also come from independent label background. So I started Big Beat and Julie was at the beginnings of Def Jam. And so you slice us open, we still got the independent, you know, spirit. And, um, and I think that, you know, sort of oozes into what we do, you know, at Atlantic for sure. Yeah. Well, that's. It's very exciting to be here for that long. I mean, I, I came yeah. here to a party. When was that party? It was oh my God. 10 years ago? At least. At Seems least. like last week. Yeah, That's I what know. happens. I know. It was a lot of fun. Okay. So to this day, a large percentage of music lovers and record buyers don't know that Led Zeppelin and some other big British acts were actually signed on this side of the ocean by Atlantic Records. That's very rare. Mostly record companies would go shopping in Europe for acts and buy a contract to so how did that happen that Atlantic signed these acts like Led Zeppelin? Well, the Led Zeppelin story was uh, Dusty Springfield that tipped off uh, Jerry and Ahmet uh, about this new band starting, um, coming out of the New Yardbirds. And uh, so Peter Grant flew over to the U.S. and um, made the deal. You know, Ahmet and Jerry did the deal immediately. But I think, I think for the history of maybe it, let's look at the British invasion to start, like Atlantic kind of missed that. So I think it was definitely important um, for Ahmet to, and Jerry to, to get the next wave. And so they were meeting with, you know, Island and Polydor, and that's how they got Cream, Eric Clapton, um, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, Bee Gees, King Crimson, um, Amit went to London Speakeasy and, and signed Yes. Yeah, and, and Atlantic obviously having its roots in R&B, um, this really obviously changed the profile and expanded obviously the depths of the roster and, um, and topped off, I think it was 71 that Amit met with uh, Mick Jagger and signed the Rolling Stones. So that was another big... That was a good milestone. Deal. That was a good one. That worked out There's well. There's a very famous story about uh, Peter Grant, the manager of Led Zeppelin, meeting Bob Dylan. And he went over to Bob Dylan and he said, he said I manage Led Zeppelin. And Bob Dylan said, I don't tell you my problems. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that story. That's, yeah, that's what I heard. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. But I believe it. That's sounds funny. Like it's true. And, uh, oh, so, so there's a very famous 40th anniversary HBO special 
that was on television. And then there was an American Masters yeah. thing about Atlantic Records. So those are that's not available anymore. But the HBO, the, the uh, American, American Masters. American Masters was released on DVD, so that, that should be out there and probably on YouTube. Yeah. So I would suggest to people that if they really want to get a nice a nice history, that would be a great place it's great, to go. Yeah, it's a yeah. great, great yeah. piece on Atlantic. It should come out again on, on Blu-ray, but, you know. So, yeah. yeah. I saw that a long time ago. I don't remember the, the gist of it. So that was a spotlight on Amit. Was that what it, it was? It was a profile on Amit yeah. and Atlantic. Um, it was great. It was a great piece, though. Yeah. So moving down, the list of questions that, yes. we, that we have here. So you've been chairman since 2005, almost 20 years. So what have been the high and low lights of your time in charge? I know you only want to talk about the highlights, but people might be interested in some yeah, of the difficulties. Yeah, it was definitely a roller coaster. Um, obviously, the introduction of the CD was a huge boom for the industry. And, um, you know, that was smooth sailing and still Sean, until uh, Sean Fanning created Napster. And all of a sudden, you know, the industry was, you know, in deep, despair over yeah. the the piracy that was going on and it really took honestly steve jobs to um you know pull us out of that and, and with the creation of the ipod and and itunes all of a sudden you know we were transformed into digital downloads and the artists were back to getting paid again and um and then of course you know that's evolved into streaming um, which has, you know, been a huge boom for the, the industry. How is the streaming model for a record label like yours? How does that work? Is that, is that profit, a profit center? Sure, or, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, that's the, the, the primary source of how artists are getting paid yeah. from their recorded music. Yeah. But of course, you know, the, the touring aspect for the artists is obviously super significant, and so is the merch, and, um, you know, it all kind of adds up. Now you have, do you have a percentage of that kind of stuff to the merchandise and, or is that just the artist has complete control over that? Um, so in, in, in certain instances where we felt we could really make a difference and, um, you know, it's nice to have the synergies of, of art and merch and the record, um, you know, all together. So certain instances we're both involved and we'll yeah. obviously tour support the artist. So in certain instances yeah. we'll be involved in the touring as well. So do you hit clubs looking for new artists or do you have a, a team of people who are doing that? We've got some, we've got, you know, a handful of A&R execs out, yeah. out there and um, definitely scouting still. You know, seeing the band live is still, you know, so crucially important, you know, to how we're signing and why we're signing. Um, that's never going to change. Yeah. So how many acts do you sign a year? Um, well, uh, I mean, we're, we're probably signing like a dozen on um, between the urban side and the pop and rock side. Yeah. And what percentage end up being successful? Is that private information? Well, we, <laughs> <as well? laughs> um, listen, the, the success, um, it, it takes time to build new yeah. artists and, um, and, um, you know, we, we definitely deem a success if we get on first base and then move forward and try and get to second base. Like, um, not everything has to be a home run. Um, I think really building an artist's fan base is the most important thing and building sticky fans. Um, that's, you know, that's really the key. And is social media critical to that? That has become yeah. absolutely critical. Do you find artists on TikTok and places like that? TikTok is definitely breaking records. It's breaking songs. Oh. I think it's not necessarily breaking artists. I think you need the the record labels to really be doing the work to surround the virality of, of a hit that might jump off from TikTok or YouTube Shorts or Instagram Reels. I think you know there are obviously all the other essentials and fundamentals to breaking an artist um, that go into it. So it's not just about one song. Yeah. So I have a young man writing for me who's 17 years old, and he tells me that his friends, because their attention span has been so shortened by this, that they don't listen to whole songs anymore. Have you heard this? Well, and we're, a problem. We're, we're definitely, you're definitely seeing a trend for a shorter duration of songs themselves. You'll certainly notice, like, songs are getting shorter, um, in, in the new era. And there's no question, you know, fans are reacting to 15 second clips, 30 second clips. Like 
those will be a uh, profound enough impact that can really drive a song. So that's real. And then do they actually pay attention to the entire song or is, is that their experience with the song? Well, you hope you, hope you can <laughs> then drive them to the streaming platforms and actually listen to the full song. Uh, I think it does. Um, and then, then the real challenge is to get them to listen to the entire album. That's a big challenge. That's a big challenge. And so let's move to the thing that's close to both of our hearts, Yes. which is vinyl records, yes. the resurgence of vinyl records. Did you ever expect this to happen? Um, I, you know, I was, I was definitely a fan early on, starting as a DJ and then sort of living in all the New York mom and pop record stores back then. And so I was kind of collecting in all genres of music at the time. Um, mainly as a DJ, you know, so that I really kind of wanted to be known for the DJ that no matter what the theme of the night was, whether it was Brazilian or African or punk rock, I could, I could um, be the one that had probably the deepest collection. So I got very much just in love with, um, with vinyl and obviously it sounds incredible yeah. and just the tactile feel of, of holding that record, listening to it, paying attention to the art and the credits and the art obviously has great meaning and impact. So um, I was, suffice to say, very scared when the music industry was trumpeting the next format as a CD, as a CD and um, basically signaling and messaging that, you know, the vinyl era is over and it's going to become extinct. And, you know, thank goodness it held on just, you know, by the skin yeah. of its teeth. And there were still little bits of vinyl, you yeah. know, coming out in the 90s and, and um, through the, the, the 2000s. Um, and then, you know, it just exploded again. And it was, um, I don't think anyone could have predicted such a return no. to to what it is now, but it's, you know, the most beautiful I, thing I to see. I always wanted it to happen, and yeah. I always would sit around saying, what, just kids have to experience it, sit down. Now I visit people in, the, like, late 40s and early 50s who have a wall of records, no television in the room, a nice stereo with big speakers, right. and they sit around and they just play records the way I did in the 70s, and it's, yeah. it's just the greatest it's amazing. thing. amazing, yeah. It is amazing. Is what percentage thing. of the business... Uh, accounts for, you know, vinyl. It's, it's not a, still not a big thing. It's, right? it's not big, but it's been growing. I mean, it's growing um, year on year out. And now it is definitely a significant um, revenue driver for the artists. Absolutely. Yeah. Like it's becoming meaningful, like a really meaningful number. Which is great. Yeah. Just a brief interruption, esteemed viewers. As you may know, I'm Tom Martin, Chief Content Officer of The Absolute Sound. We have a new product. It's on the Substack platform, and we're going to do some interesting things with Substack. First of which is reader questions and answers. Each Monday, readers will submit questions. We'll pick the most interesting ones, and we'll answer the questions on Friday. We'll also have early access to articles and special blogs that don't appear anywhere else. We hope you'll join us. It's only a cost of a cup of coffee per month. Just check on the screen or in the show notes below. Thanks, and now back to the show. I remember driving down 14th Street one day in a hot August dog day, and there you were, walking oh. down 14th Street with two <laughs> bags of records. Right. And people said, is this Craig Cameron? Is he really into vinyl like he says he is? I said, yeah, I saw him walking down 14th Street at like 90 degrees, schlepping the bags, putting yeah. the bags down, taking a break, taking it up. The traffic was slow. And I think I, I waved to you. That That's was so, funny. so hilarious. Funny. So let's talk about the 75th anniversary yes. celebration here. So it's got two tracks. So one track are things that Atlantic is producing and releasing themselves. Correct. And then the other track is you, you've uh, brought um, Chad Kasim on board mm -hmm. to do these audiophile level records. So how do you determine which goes where and how did that all work? Yeah, I think, you know, we wanted to, with, with the um, analog productions, you know, find 75 titles that really um, were covering the breadth and scope of Atlantic um, and, you know, really... Uh, putting um, out there how diverse the label was 
Um, I mean, you know, when you look at the jazz history, the rock history, the R&B history, the soul history, um, and then, you know, as time progressed, what would be called alternative and, and obviously the rock side and hard rock side. Um, I think the, the job was really to pick a great cross section of music from all the genres that Atlantic has been Did known you do for. That? M myself, Julie, and Chad. Yeah. Yeah. So that was that was fun, probably. Yeah, cause absolutely. Because of the whole history. Absolutely. And then for Chad's part of it, you got to make sure there were tapes for his stuff. Yes, you won't for do sure. it without the tapes. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And all those tapes were found. Yeah. And, you know, Chad, he's, you know, he's fantastic record man himself. You yeah. know, he's so passionate. I, I've been to Salina, Kansas, yeah. and um, I've seen the whole operation. And it's, it's really an extraordinary operation that he you has. You know how he started, right? Do you know how he started? Tell me the story. Well, I, I roasted him at an event in L.A., which you should watch because it's hilarious. I, I compared him to Moses floating down the Mississippi River on a, on a, on a bed of uh, clarinet reeds. Oh, that's funny. And it's a whole long story. But Chad moved to Salina for personal reasons and uh, started selling records out of milk crates. Oh, wow. And he noticed that the audiophiles were buying these RCAs and these Mercuries. So he went about finding those and advertising those on in Goldmine. And that's how he started. Oh, I didn't even and know that And he was a short story. order cook in wow. Salina. That's how it all started. Wow, amazing. And then it wasn't that many years later when the governor would see Chad at a restaurant and come over to Chad. And it's in a, it's a... There's a story being told yeah. about that, actually. There's oh, a movie yes, being made. Yes. Yeah. It, yeah, it's a great it's an amazing doc. story. Yeah, it's going to be a great one. Yeah. And so I've got a couple of those records, and apparently the, the, the Phil Collins record is just yeah, going bonkers. Yeah, exploding, yeah. Yeah. Which is great to see. So you wonder who's, who's buying this. Is it new people discovering Phil Collins or, and Genesis, or is it... I, I really know. believe it's both. I really yeah. think it's both. Yeah. Obviously, the, you know, the people that grew up on it, yeah. um, you know, getting such a high audiophile version of it is, um, is super appealing. But I, I think, listen, young kids are able to really discover music, you know, with everything at their fingertips for $9.99. Um, and you being able to discover the entire world's history of music for the most part, um, that's a pretty awesome thing. So I think yeah. there's lots of discovery of the catalog. And it's great that people are spending the extra money to buy something mm -hmm. for $40 yeah. or more Absolutely. that they could get for almost nothing. Yeah. Absolutely. Because they want to have it. That's really a key to this whole thing. No question. And when the packaging is great, it's, right. it's something you want to treasure. Yeah, and makes it a really I mean, that nice. Migas Blues and Roots, it's an incredible sound. Sounded record. great, yeah. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah. All right, what else have we got here? Um, so what, what's coming out that you, what are the titles that you are releasing uh, through, through Atlantic? What, what was your decision making there? Um, I think, you know, there's um, a lot of the current um, roster and what we would kind of consider the more shallow catalog. So a lot of stuff also from 90s, 2000s, 2010s, um, you know, to really give a cross section of, you know, our hip hop history, our R&B history, our alternative rock history. So you're, you're seeing a lot of, or you have seen a lot of releases month to month um, that are really reflecting also just the more modern era of what we've done. And that's, that stuff is coming out on vinyl as well? Correct. Yeah. And CD, CDs are making somewhat of a comeback too. They so. are, and we're even having to do cassettes for, gonna, for yeah. some people. Some artists are really into having a cassette yeah. available, which we do as well. I'll know that's back when I see uh, miles of tape wound around telephone poles. Until I see that, I won't, I won't, <laughs> I won't believe that. So, are there any personal favorites of yours from the 50s and the six, 50s through the 80s that, uh, that you, when you became the chairman of Atlantic, you were saying, wow, these are records that I grew up with that I love and yeah. I'm in charge of that catalog? Yeah, I mean, as, as just a fan growing up as a young teenager and then into my DJ years. I mean, Led Zeppelin for me was my number one band um, growing up. And um, and I was also really a fan of, you know, Ray Charles and Otis Redding and Aretha Franklin. And so when I had the unbelievable opportunity to meet with Amit and Doug Morris and them say, hey, we'd love to bring Big Beat Records into Atlantic, um, you know, I had to pinch myself because yeah. these were 
this was the iconic label for me that, you know, I was just a, such a fan of growing up as a, as a teenager and then, you know, through my DJ years as well. How did that happen? They called you or, I mean, that's I, a call you want to get, right? <laughs> it was a very good call. I, um, <laughs> I actually had put out um, an artist named Joe Manda. It was on the Big Beat label. And um, Joey Carvello had brought it in to Doug Morris. And um, I got the opportunity to sit and, you know, kibitz with Doug and tell him my story. And, and how and, old were you and, at that time? And with Amit. Um, this was 1987, so I was 22. Oh, how heady was that? And that, that was pretty intense. I mean, to be able to sit with Amit and Doug and, you know, sort of talk about my little label was was a pretty big deal and kind of awe-inspiring and um how, how did they find out about your label i mean how did that i think it was it was they said to me they couldn't believe that i as a small label was getting so many of my records on mainstream radio uh, so i had my my records on like z100 and and the dance stations you know ktu and bls and and um and how did you do that I, I kind of learned from, I used to work at Billboard magazine, I used to work at Factory Records, um, doing promotion and marketing, I used to work for CBS Records as a college rep. So I kind of got, got an understanding of like what it takes to promote a record. And that was, that meant going to every DJ in all the nightclubs, which I was familiar with already. And then going to radio stations and waiting on radio day to sit and hold, get your turn to play your record to the music director and program director. So I used to spend all my days, you know, waiting to see Frankie Crocker at WBLS um, and, and finally get that few minutes to tell him about a record. And so this Jomanda record kind of exploded and we had Steve Silk Hurl and had him do a remix of it and he did just an incredible version and sort of exploded across the country and it was getting on all the radio stations. And that's when Doug and Amit brought me in and said, you know, you remind me of us when we were doing our independent thing. Because yeah. Doug had Big Tree and, um, and Amit, of course, Atlantic. And so it was, um, yeah, it was just, you know, amazing to be able to. And who negotiated that deal for you? Did you do it yourself? Or it was, you... no, actually my, my father did actually. He was Good. a that's, lawyer. That's, yeah. yeah. I was going to say, you don't want to do that yourself. No, no, no. Because as much as they love you and want you, they'll still take advantage of a kid. Well, everybody does. You know, everybody does. It, was, know, it was such a big opportunity yeah, of course. for me. You know, I used to do radio commercials in Boston for $50 a piece. I should have charged them 250 <laughs> or 300 but I, I, my self-worth wasn't there, so, so I didn't. But good for you. Thank you. You know, um, Doug Morris tried to bring vinyl back in the 90s that was the, the heavy vinyl series that, that mm -hmm. MCA did. And I was involved in that. And so we made these great records, cut from analog tape, did the whole number, 180 gram and everything. But at that time, there was no place to sell the records because right. the stores weren't the selling stores records weren't, yeah. and there was no internet to sell records. So it, it was right. a flop. But, right. So the timing is so important in Absolutely. these things. Absolutely, yeah, for sure. So looking at the 80s, what, 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 were, the, what were the standouts for you? I mean, obviously, you know, the evolution of, of Genesis and then, you know, spawning into the solo work of Phil Collins um, in excess was an incredible band. Yeah. Um, there was just um, a, a 70s and 80s, like the Spinners was a big favorite yeah. of mine. Um, and they, they were flops on a previous label, right? They were on Motown and didn't do anything, right? <clears throat> yeah, it was really, you know, Tom Lam Bell, yeah. you know paired up with them and yeah. um just made so many incredible incredible records and um and then you know listen aretha continued um donny hathaway yeah great stuff yeah great stuff so what do you see for the next five years for the 80th anniversary um you know we got our head down there's there's lots of exciting stuff i mean you know music is now so global you know the yeah. The barriers have come down, so you know we're exploring everything from Afrobeat with artists like Burner Boy to obviously the Latin side of the business is exploding and really exciting. And um, 
Yeah, I mean, there's just so much music now coming from all walks of the globe. It's important to just pay paying attention to all of it. And do you think the uh, the business model has stabilized now? So there's streaming, and then there's uh, physical media, and it's stabilized now. There's not like people looking around. What are we going to do about this? It's, it seems pretty stable. Yeah, I way. think so. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. I think the business is now in a great place, and it's so great um, that vinyl is, you know, matured to what it is. It's amazing. Yeah, it is good. There, there are some issues I have about it that we can talk about off camera that I'll tell you about. Maybe you can exert your influence to do something about it, but that'll be off camera. I'm, I'm all ears. All right, great. Well, this was great. Craig, I really appreciate you taking the time and letting me talk to you about the 75th anniversary. And uh, congratulations. And let's see what happens over the next 10 years. I'm sure it'll be great. Thank you, Michael, for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Awesome. Great stuff.